Hey, welcome to Two and a Half Geeks. Today on the show, we're talking the iPhone 6 launch. A lot of stories coming out of this, and it may possibly bend in your pocket, so stay tuned for this. Uh, the Dell Inspiron 11 3000 2-in-1, the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 980, and a lot more. Stay tuned. It's rocking the benchmarks. We're going to up the ante uh, a little bit. Processing power, I kind of understand this. Hey everybody, you're watching Two and a Half Geeks. I'm Andrew Zarian. I got Marco Chapetta with us. How you doing, Marco? I'm I'm doing fantastic. I cannot complain. And of course, uh, Dave Altavilla hanging out with us also. A lot of stuff to talk about. How you doing, Dave? Doing great. Thanks for having me. I changed the way that we do this. <laughs> I I went to Marco first, and then I went to Dave. You got to you got to be fresh. Yeah, man. Way I, to mix it up. Oh, way to mix, mix it, it up. up. <laughs> If, if, if that's all we got for fresh, we're in trouble. <laughs> well, Mark, Mark, I took a shower before the show, so oh, he's, yeah, he's fresh too. He's very God. fresh. Um, I'm very fresh and clean. Since we're on the topic of fresh, let's talk about the new iPhone six. A lot of people getting the new iPhone six. A lot of numbers coming out. Ten million units sold over the launch weekend. Uh, I believe it was four million pre-orders. This thing is very difficult to get, especially if you're looking to get the larger one. But there are some stories coming in, like it bending. Uh, Dave, Marco, do you think this this story where this phone is bending, and you're seeing all the viral videos, right, where they're taking this thing, and they're pushing it, and they're cracking the sides, and, and they're saying, well, this is awful, it's not bending, but my Galaxy Note 3 is, you know, that, that thing is solid. Do you think it's a little exaggerated, or do you think this is a big problem for a lot of people with skinny jeans, you know, that have no room in their pockets? It's looking to me so, like it's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Can, can I can I jump in for one yeah, second? I don't want to cut Dave off as soon as he starts. It's funny. You mentioned the Note 3, right? And that's what I have right here. It's one of the phones I carry. Um, my previous phone before this was a Note 2. And right now I'm carrying a Nokia Lumia 1520. All three very big phablets. All three, they're about the same form factor or slightly bigger than the iPhone. And now I'm I'm a big guy. Um, I'm trying to change that, but I'm almost six to um, three hundred pounds ish. So I'm a big guy. I always keep my phones in my front pocket, right? And I wear jeans constantly. I work from home, so it's not like I'm in suits. I have never bent or broken a phone in my pocket. Now the iPhone six plus has been out for a few days, and there are numerous reports. So. Already the apologists are running around saying, why are you keeping a phone in your pocket? And then there's you know, the other group of people that are saying, yeah, it's metal, it's going to bend. But the bottom line is some testing either wasn't done or Apple decided that this was a, an acceptable um, situation to put out into the retail marketplace. And now people are bending their phones. Whether it's right or wrong, whether it's a big deal, it's going to depend on the you know, person listening to the story. I think it's kind of a big deal. Dave, what do you think of this? I think it's kind of a big deal as well. And I think, um, you know, dare I say, shame on Apple for not doing your mechanical uh, testing, your engineering testing, your, your stress testing, uh, all of that, that industrial design that Apple, quite frankly, has been known for and given accolades for over the years. They totally screwed the pooch, yeah. <laughs> in my opinion. On this thing, I mean, if, if you get a, an iPhone 6 Plus, it is clear, abundantly clear, that you have to be very careful with it. And and folks are reporting bending, you know, and warping by placing the phone in the in, in the front pocket, not sitting on it, you know, in the back pocket. But even that, I mean, quite frankly, I have a I have a Google Nexus 5. I throw it in my back pocket all the time and sit on it halfway, not fully. Um, you know, I'm not like slamming down on it, but I'll throw it in my back pocket and sit down. No problem. I don't think we're talking about that kind of abuse. I think we're talking about standard use. And there's even been some video footage of guys literally bending it by hand. If you can warp the frame that easily by hand and it doesn't snap back, you got a mechanical engineering problem. Somebody yeah. really missed it. Now, you know, it's funny. I, I, I sort of, I put this in the in the show notes, in the rundown, to talk about amongst ourselves about how these phones have been received in the market. Certainly, they've been received well. People are buying them by the tens of millions, as you noted, Andrew. Um, I, I, I still really struggle with what Apple's done here versus the competition. Even if you don't consider the warping issue, 
currently, which is really, it's a fly in the ointment for the 6 Plus. Uh, I guess the 4.7 inch standard 6 maybe doesn't have this issue. We haven't heard any issue for it yet. But it's a real big fly in the ointment of what I would think, personally, what I'm viewing as a total catch-up product. There's nothing revolutionary about it at all. Yes, it's got a faster processor. Sure, the A8 is a really strong chip. Kudos to Apple for that. 64-bit ARM processor, uh, faster than the previous Gen A7. Bigger screen, 1920 by 1080, you know, 401 PPI, nice, uh, tight, you know, 5.5-inch 1920 by 1080 screen on the 6 Plus, 1134 by 750 on the 6. So, you know, good high-resolution screens. They made a bigger phone, but there's nothing about these phones that gives you that that sort of Apple, you know, wonderment that, you know, something revolutionary that they tend to try and introduce with every iteration or new major iteration of an iPhone. For the iPhone 5S, it was the A7, the first 64-bit smartphone SoC. That was kind of their big play there, and, and certainly it was monumental um, in terms of mobile devices. Um, but the 6 and 6 Plus are catch-up, and I'm not really seeing anything that Android doesn't have. I mean, Apple's got, you know, iOS 8 is a beautiful OS, and God knows they've got a great ecosystem, but wow, really sort of left flat by the launch, and then to have this um, quality issue? Yeah. Ouch. Yeah, Ouch. see, this this is a problem in, uh, in a lot of ways. One, how do you d- real-world test people putting the phone in the front pocket and, and it bending? It shouldn't bend regardless. I'm actually surprised we're not seeing the bending problem happen on the regular uh, iPhone 6 because it's thinner than the 6 Plus. Yeah, you would think you would think mechanically it would have the issues. I, I don't think you've got the same sort of area, right? You're, you're talking about, you know, the, the, the laws of physics at play here. And I'm not sure with the 4.7 inch device, you'd get enough area to, to provide that much flex in standard use. Um but yeah, is is the uh, you know I'm not familiar between the differences in in the um, in the chassis of the devices. I believe the six is the same chassis composition as the six plus. Is that right, Marco? Are you aware of that one? Yeah, it's the same chassis composition, but I, I think you're, you're touching on it properly. You can't get the same kind of leverage at the breaking point on the smaller because on the of smaller the size. Device. Yeah. 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 I'm curious on uh, how Apple's going to respond to this. Are we going to get a you're sitting wrong response or are they going to say, well, you know what? We are noticing that the aluminum is a little soft on the sides. And, you know, if they issue a recall on this, they're going to talk about millions and millions of devices being called back. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think there's a possibility of a recall. Um, there's really a three ways they could respond. It could be recall it. It could be you're sitting on it wrong. Um or they could actually just completely ignore it because, you know, lots of people, this is the thing with Apple products. So many people come to their defense, no matter what, that even if it is an issue for a huge part of their fan base, it's not an issue. It's somebody else yeah. doing something wrong. So I don't know. I would be <laughs> surprised. And, and I hear what you're saying, Marco. And, and, and you know, again, you have to, you have to hand it to Apple. If they've got a passionate enough fan base, a passionate en- enough consumer install base that they can incite that sort of loyalty that you would overlook something like this, then that's, that's, that's a significant you know, statement on the brand equity in and of itself. However, I would be very surprised if current iPhone 6 Plus owners, uh, you know, a good majority of them don't have a real issue with this. I would be very surprised, and, and I, would, I would think Apple would have to respond in some way. I don't know if it's recall. Obviously, that's, that's pretty you know, major league, but maybe it's, you know, if you have an issue, take it to the Genius Bar, and I, I think, I don't know, it, it, it would seem to me that they would have to retool this, this case at some point, the, the chassis, to, to make it more rigid. I mean... To, to Marco, to your point, the competition does not have this issue, not even close, ever. Yeah, <laughs> I can't. I can't think well, of anybody else that has had this issue. No, I, I saw a couple of. Uh, of course, my phone's going to ring. Let me just uh, hang the, that. People up. are calling <laughs> to find out if if the phone has had an issue. So, I, I've seen a couple of uh, a couple of folks posting pictures of other bent phones, but you know they're digging up 
photos from years ago and it's it's not widespread issues um, so I, I don't know of any widespread issue on, on any other devices and I totally lost my train of thought where I was gonna go with this just now. <laughs> so this is the joys of, of filming live but the oh I now remember what I was gonna say we haven't seen a lot of it in the past but here here's the issue there's been very few phones with metal frames and now the note 4 is about to come out for Samsung with a metal frame it would be, I don't know if it's possible, but with that metal frame not being able to flex back like a plastic or a composite, it's possible something big like the Note 4 might have a similar issue. We don't know yet, That's obviously, but it's a possibility. I am very curious if Samsung is starting to put this thing through some sort of testing similar to what's happening. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> yeah, well, one, one would hope. You know, we, we have seen some... Some five-inch devices, the HTC One M8, for example, has a metal frame. There's been a few other metal frame devices, certainly in the five-inch range. But five and a half does does expose you uh, significantly more with the, with that extra area for sure. Oh, absolutely. It'll be inter interesting to see. Um, you know, but but again, I, you know, I still har I still you know kind of fall back or recount exactly what Apple's done here with this launch. Um, certainly, they're selling a boatload of them because they have again that that passionate customer uh fan base and install base of existing iphones out there um but you know nfc or or you know apple pay there's nothing new there that's been on google for a long or google platform uh, android excuse me google's platform for a long time um you know they've certainly legitimized that with uh, bringing on mastercard and visa i think that's huge i think um you know that will help it gain traction so again hats off to them for that but in terms of the overall product offering, I'm personally underwhelmed, and I hope they do react. It would really show, it, it, it would impress me the most of this, of all the sort of um, salient points of this launch for Apple. It would impress me the most if they really responded and took some sort of stand up action on this bend gate or warp yeah. gate issue. Yeah, <laughs> which, I, which we all doubt here that they are. Uh, you touch on something, you touch on NFC. Um, do you think uh, NFC has been slow to take off with especially uh, a paying method for a lot of people? A lot of stores have NFC. A lot of people don't use NFC. Do you think Apple incorporating NFC and having their mobile payment system now uh, available, is that going to boost the use of NFC or it's really a non-event for most people? I think it's gonna. I think it's gonna boost it. I think it's going to be interesting to see the adoption rate and and how often you see folks at retail using these devices uh, at the register or what have you. Um, I think it's going to be a lot like what you see now with, for example, going to the airport and having your boarding pass showing on your screen. That's phenomenal. You see it. Yeah, it's great to have. It's very convenient. You see it, but it's like, what, one in every six people going on the plane, wave their phone in front of the, you know, the gate attendant or what have you. Um, I, I think that's kind of what you'll see with NFC. People are still... You know, they, they get credit cards, they get cash, you know, handing my phone, waving my phone in front of a device. Um, certain usage models and applications, other than just like right at the retail storefront, um, might lend themselves better, you know, kiosk sort of applications or something like that. But I think it's going to be a while, but Apple stepping into it and Visa and MasterCard, you know, sort of hopping on the, the bandwagon with them in this iPhone sort of uh, tag team launch, I, I think it's, it's a lot a lot, of, a lot of traction for it. Right, what was gonna, that? I have no idea. A video started <laughs> playing for some reason, and uh, we gonna have to, we're going to have to edit that out. That is bizarre. That's no biggie. Yeah. <laughs> I just muted it. I have no idea where that came from. I guess that was our cue to move on. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why don't we talk about the Dell Inspiron 11 uh, 3000? Now, this is a two-in-one. Uh, it's a convertible laptop. It's catering towards students or pro users who is this device for uh dave why don't, why don't you take this sure so um yeah josh gulick uh, took a look at this laptop for us uh, from the folks at dell and this is an interesting uh, what i would call crossover uh device um it is a two-in-one hybrid uh notebook slash tablet convertible uh, it is traditionally a 11.6 inch, you know, notebook form factor, smaller keyboard, but, um, you know, again, larger than a netbook or the classical sense for a netbook. 
uh, and um, but also has a fully articulating hinge such that you can flip it over, fold it in half, and it turns into, as you're seeing there on the screen, a tablet uh, usage model. Uh, what I like about the device, and, and we rated it well, we gave it a hot hardware approved. Um, it's very low cost. The model we tested was sort of the, the upper end of the configuration, believe it or not. You can actually get these for as little as $349. Um, $449, you get a quad core, a Core N3530, which is actually Intel Pentium, believe it or not, brand, although it has nothing to do with the Pentium architecture of old. Uh, this is a quad core uh, device with Intel integrated graphics and it has you know all of the good features of Intel's current generation notebook platform including USB 3 and all that good stuff uh, 802.11n um, Wi-Fi um, and 4 gig of DDR3 RAM and you know all the, the current uh, generation of uh, of Intel technology for the for the notebook platform um, but what's different about this is you've got now a quad-core uh, device that drops into a 7.5-watt uh, TDP or thermal power design. So you can get these really thin, you know, uh, light, small form factor um, notebook styles that we see here with the Dell. And it's, um, you know, it, it sort of performs in between um, as well in terms of uh, general use and performance it's in between a tablet and a notebook that way it's a little bit more powerful certainly more powerful than a tablet not quite as powerful powerful as the average ultrabook however i'm i'm looking at the pictures i mean it, it's it's a it's a nice looking laptop what's the price point on this so yeah again it's it's 449 as as we tested it and that comes standard with a 500 gig 5400 rpm hard drive um, so nothing whiz bang there, no SSDs, 11.6 inch screen, 1366 by 768 res. So not super high res, but 720p sort of, uh, HD res, not full 1080p. Um, but an 11 inch screen, 11.6 inch screen, you know, I think that's plenty personally. Um, others may like a higher res screen, windows eight, all that good stuff. And a, a 43 watt hour battery. Now, um, again, what you're getting here, if, if you looked at some of our performance numbers, is a, is a device that performs, would, would blow the average tablet out of the water from a, from a horsepower standpoint, whether it be CPU and, and GPU, actually, um, but um, doesn't quite compete with the average Ultrabook that way. So it's, it's interesting to me in, in that it, it offers a very low price point, good, great battery life. Um, multiple usage models for folks that, you know, want a little bit of a tablet utility as well as having that full keyboard at, at the ready uh, and attached to the, to the machine. But again, it's, 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 a, it's an in-betweener. It's, it's still almost an inch thick. It's still three pounds, which is, you know, probably three times as much as any average 10-inch tablet, right? So it's a tweener product for sure. But I think what's, what's, what's interesting about this product and, and what's coming down the road for Intel and, and what, what we should talk about next is that Intel has been seeding the market with this um, platform, with this two-in-one hybrid approach. And what you'll see now is, sure, certainly Dell with this machine, this Inspiron, Inspiron 11 3000, um, really neat little product offering for the student uh, or the average business user that needs super mobility on the go and, and also uh, maybe a, the ability to, to read on, a, on the plane with a tablet form factor or something like that. But moving forward, you'll see, uh, as Intel has been sort of seeding the market with this two-in-one approach, you'll see even more powerful de devices based on their Broadwell platform, which is their 14 nanometer low power Broadwell chip that um, is the follow-on uh, to um, their 22 nanometer product that you're seeing in, in devices like this today, in this Dell device. Really more first half 2015 we'll see a, a sort of a, a trickle of these at the end of the year but you'll see two in ones as thin as tablets with detachable keyboards that have all the power of your average notebook today and they're going to be impressive now the the fact that they're that thin that's because uh these are fanless right the the 14 nanometer chips right so and and marco can can sort of tee off on this as well but Again, what you're looking at here with, with the Dell device is a 7.5-watt processor from Intel at 22 nanometer, their previous generation uh, technology and manufacturing process. Moving forward, Broadwell is going to be 14 nanometer, and now you're talking about a 4.5-watt chip wow. 
no fans, but twice, probably twice the horsepower of this chip that's in the Dell device. Uh, and moving forward, you know, you're, you're going to see, you know, full notebook processors in a four and a half watt envelope. Mark, I want you to talk about this a little bit because I'm very fascinated in uh, the fanless approach to these, you know, not not low end laptops, I guess a little above low end, uh, the mid range. Uh, if they go fanless, I mean, if, if a lot of these manufacturers start incorporating, you know, the Broadwell chipset, the 14 nanometer chipset, you're going to see a lot of super, super thin computers coming out in 2015. So that's that's exactly the allure of Broadwell. You're, you're, Intel's using this more advanced manufacturing process to not only make smaller and more powerful chips, but they, they've also reduced the size of the packaging. So you end up with a a processor with the full core architecture. So, you know, Bay Trail, previous Atom based designs aren't the same processor core as desktop processors in the Core i family. So the Core M, you know, is a f what Intel calls their big core. It's their full high performance core, but now shrunk down to these super low power envelopes. And yeah, you're going to end up with these tablet form factors with the similar or you know better processor performance than some of today's current full-size laptops or ultrabooks so the this whole two-in-one movement hasn't completely caught on because you either had really good battery life but a slower atom processor experience or you know a, a higher clocked maybe top of the line bay trail and not quite very i mean good battery life not bad battery life but not quite the battery life of a tablet Broadwell sort of answers all that. You get the full core performance out of the processor cores, but excellent, excellent battery life as well. And you know, Intel's reference platform, and this, this wasn't a retail product. This was the reference platform they were using to show off Broadwell. It was almost as nice as an iPad, you know, or even an wow. iPad Air, this super thin, beautiful, fanless, quiet, high-performance device you know, that can run full 3D Mark, Cinebench, do it all. It's not competing with a desktop system in terms of performance, but really good performance for the form factor. So I think Broadwell could finally usher in an era where two-in-ones and tablets based on Intel are the most desirable platform. It's, it's looking like a strong product. Now, I'm can looking... You... Go ahead, Dave. No, I was going to say, can you cut to the, um, I, I sent you a link to uh, the, the Broadwell um, demonstration uh, from IDF. Can you cut to that? Can you, can you show on, on the screen that? Which uh, demo is this? It was, the, it was one of the links I put in there for, for Broadwell. And it will show the folks what, you're, what, you're, what we're looking at here in terms of form factor. Uh, are we talking about the... So it's the, should be this, uh, the... Studio the second Broadwell link. Yep. Yep. Let me just pull that up here. Actually, it would be the first Broadwell first link. Okay. Link. I'll pull that one up right now. Uh, yeah. I'm, I was actually looking at the second one, which we'll get to, and there's a, uh, a nice roadmap, I guess, of, of what they're planning on doing and what the chips are going to be. But, Dave, until I pull this up, do you how do, what do you feel about uh, the incorporation of the chipset for you know beefier computers a little bit or what kind of computers are going to see this this 14 nanometer chipset incorporated in yeah the initial rollout is going to be what they call broadwell y which is the um the the very low power variant the four and a half watt fanless variant you're going to see two in ones and tablets uh very much like you know we we gave you a quick hands-on at uh, at idf um you know that tablet that that's being held there you're going to see two-in-ones with that at first, and then you'll see um, higher-end, higher-performance uh, devices as well. Yeah, there it is right there. So so taking a look at it there, you, you're looking at a 10.5-inch, um, actually, is it? I'm sorry, 12.5-inch tablet, so a little bit larger tablet. But literally, this thing is, uh, I think it's like uh, 0.7 or something like that. Um, it's it's super thin. Um, it is it is iPad Air kind of thin, 12.5-inch tablet and as you can see it's running full three mark you know benchmarks and um and cinebench and all that good stuff offering the performance of of a full notebook ultrabook um platform so the, the follow-on to that will be the 15 watt variant which will be um broadwell i'm, I'm not sure if it's going to be broadwell uh, the the ult version broadwell y is for tablets and and uh, two-in-ones 
the four and a half watt, but the follow on will be a 15 watt variant, I imagine, or thereabouts. And that will offer that much more performance, that much more um, capability in a standard notebook platform with, with better battery life. So good stuff all around. Uh, again, you know, that, that two in one form factor that is out in the market now, really great buys to be had. Dell's Inspiron 11 there is certainly an example of that. But uh, in 2015, we're going to see some really impressive stuff in that thin convertible form factor. Should be fun. Yeah, uh, I'm actually interested to get my hands on that Dell. It actually looks good. Uh, the only thing I'm not crazy about is the bezel, but you're going to get that with a lot of these 2-in-1s because it still has a function as a tablet, and yeah, these tablets yeah. still have a bezel on them. Yeah, yeah, I think you'll see less and less bezel, and you'll see thinner and thinner form factors. Uh, again, you're talking about a design there with the Dell that, that has a fan on board, you know, and when you get rid of the fan, you don't have to vent. You can get, you know, really trim them up nice and... and you know, remove material from around that display all over the place. Now, Marco, uh, I want to talk to you about this uh, this next story. I want to talk to you about the uh, GTX 980 and the 970. I'm in the market for a video card. So whenever I see something po posted on Hot Hardware that that's talking about, you know, the latest and the greatest and some of these reviews that you guys are doing, uh, my ears perk up or my eyes opened up actually to read it. <laughs> Because uh, I'm in the market and I'm looking to replace my, my older video card in here. So what can you tell us about this? Um, I, I can tell you a lot. And let me first, let me just hold this up here. This is the GTX 980. Ooh. And let, me just, let me just rub it a little oh, bit. So it's pretty. So nice. <laughs> oh, it's so nice. So, yes, this is uh, NVIDIA's <laughs> new, new flagship right here. This is a, a reference design. You'll see lots of custom models in the marketplace. And this is the... The first flagship GPU based on the company's uh, big Maxwell microarchitecture. So Maxwell first debuted with the, the GTX 750, but that was a small, low-power chip. This is using a, a much bigger, more powerful chip. But the GTX 980, first let me just say, fastest single GPU card we've tested. But if you look at the specs... It's kind of an, an, an enigma, if I can pronounce that properly. If you look at the number of CUDA cores in a GTX 980, there's 2,048, whereas the 780 Ti had 2,880. The 980 also has 128 texture units, whereas the 780 Ti had 240. The 780 Ti also had a 384-bit memory interface, whereas the 980 has a 256-bit memory interface with the same uh, speed memory. So... You would think, looking at the specs, that this card would offer a lower performance than the GTX 780 Ti. But it's not the case. NVIDIA has engineered such a, an efficient chip, it's able to be better utilized you know, throughout every stage of the graphics pipeline, basically. And it's overall faster than a what should be technically a more powerful chip in the previous GK110. So in basically every benchmark across the board, the GTX 980 was the fastest we tested at every resolution from 1920 by 1200 through 4K. I tested everything in between, or every major resolution in between, I should say. So killer graphics card across the board. But NVIDIA has also incorporated some cool new features uh, with these cards. There's a feature called Dynamic Super Resolution that essentially allows users to render a game at a higher resolution than their monitor. So let's say you have a 1080p screen, which is the most popular resolution right now for gamers. And you're playing a game that, you know, any graphics card can run at top speed. So you're playing Left 4 Dead 2, and your current graphics card can do 180 frames per second at 1080p, which is complete overkill. And even if you crank everything up in terms of AA, you're still getting acceptable frame rates. But when those images are filtered and sent out to your screen, there's still artifacts, you know, grass blades aren't perfectly crisp. Sometimes you'll see fencing that's not just right. And as you pan and move throughout a scene, you'll see those, those elements not fully rendered. Or things kind of pop in and out or, or kind of sparkle as you move. With the 980, you can output that game to 4K, let's say, even on your 1080p screen, so when all of the sampling's being done for anti-aliasing or what have you, it's using a much higher resolution grid to determine, you know, the colors for each edge when they're anti-aliasing an object. And then it shrunk down and you end up with better image quality overall, but still acceptable frame rates. So 
it's a really it's sort of like super sampling but not quite and sort of like the down sampling that you know some uh you know some geeks are doing with their games but nvidia's refined it with a nice filter and you know real simple to implement cool feature right there there's also a new anti-aliasing mode coming it wasn't available in the current driver but it's it's called uh, multi-frame anti-aliasing mfaa and basically what it's doing is taking a i know the mfaa <laughs> oh, sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's it takes you know a half the let's say versus 4x multi sampled AA um MFAA will take two samples on one frame alternate the sample pattern and take two samples on the next frame and I'm kind of simplifying it but you'll get the gist here and two samples from the next frame so ultimately you end up with the same number of samples as multi uh multi sampling AA but with half the bandwidth or half the you know half of the resources consumed, so you end up with the quality of 4xAA for you know 30% better performance. It's just it's an innovative way or a new way to do anti-aliasing that can boost performance without negatively affecting image quality, unless there's fast-moving objects. So if there's something that's moved drastically from frame to frame, it doesn't quite work as well. But generally, you know, the, the result is good in what we've seen in NVIDIA demos. I haven't been able to test it yet because it's not in the driver. But, uh, you know, not only fast, powerful new card, but cool new features as well. Now, the, the 9... Uh, I'm sorry, the 970 compared to the 980. Uh, you're talking about the 980 is 549, the 970 is 329. Um, right. As far as the performance was, was there would the average gamer notice any kind of performance issues comparing the two, or the the most you know hardcore gamer, the one that's really into the benchmarking of this, is is going to be the one that notices? Because for me, the nine seventy kind of looks appealing at three twenty nine. The, the nine seventy seventy looks looks very appealing. So if if you're asking if an average gamer is going to see a difference, probably not. Because like I said, the average gamer is probably on a ten eighty p screen. These cards could render anything at 1080p, no problem at high frame rates. So the experience would probably be similar. If you run benchmarks, the 980 is clearly faster than the 970. The 970 is still very fast, though. You're looking at a card that's about on par with AMD's 290X. So you're talking top of the line performance, maybe not you know the best of the best, but among the best performing cards out there. And for 329, that kind of performance is a steal. The the only real difference between the 980 and the 970 are the number of active cores and texture units. Basically, it has the same memory, uh, same memory interface, but you're looking at a uh, 1664 active CUDA processors and 104 texture units. So not the full implementation of the of the chip. But still, you know, offers plenty of horsepower for all of today's games, um, especially for mainstream gamers or people that would be looking for a three hundred dollar ish graphics card. If you've got a ten eighty p screen or even a fourteen forty p screen, excellent performance at those resolutions for, you know, I'm not going to say three twenty nine is cheap, but for the kind of performance and features the card offers, yeah, it's it's a pretty darn good buy. I can see the nine seventy being very popular, and on top of that. Both of the cards are super overclockable. NVIDIA was obviously being conservative with these chips. The the 980, a reference 980, so not even a crazy one with a huge cooler. A reference 980 is clocked with a base clock of 1126 with a boost clock of 1216 megahertz. With minimal tweaking, I didn't even mess with voltages. I just, I upped the power envelope, I upped the fan speed, or I should say I upped the target GPU temperature and started just altering clocks. 1440 megahertz wow. in literally a few minutes messing around with it. I have colleagues that, you know, were messing with voltages, had no problem taking a reference card over 1500 megahertz. So I think NVIDIA was conservative with the 980. They brought it out as is because, like I said, it's fast enough to be the fastest card out there. But if by some chance AMD has an answer and they come out with a card that can match or beat this relatively quickly, I would not be surprised to see NVIDIA just crank up the dials, put a little faster memory on it, crank up the GPU clocks, and have a GTX 980 Ti uh, relatively quickly if they wanted. It's actually very exciting because uh, this 970 I kind of really like. I was reading about it today, uh, and then you sent me the, the, the rundown for the show. I'm like, oh, kind of works out. 
yep. since we're talking about performance, uh, there's a you in the show notes. You guys sent me the uh, the Main Gear Pulse 15. It's a 3K gaming laptop, uh, which you guys have a review on HotHardware.com. Tell me about this because it actually for a gaming laptop, it is very good looking. <laughs> Yeah, gaming laptops don't have to be boat anchors all the time. No, they don't. (laughs) You know, it's funny. We're used to seeing them, and certainly, you know, folks like uh, Dell's Alienware division and um, others as well um, have come out with these big, you know, bodacious laptops or or machines that you call a laptop. But but really, if if it sits on your lap, it's more like a nuclear power plant that may leave you sterile when you're done. (laughs) It's it's a mid tower. It's a mid sized tower cut in half. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you know the battery is nothing more than a, a, a UPS if you know yeah. if, the, if the power cord gets tripped. But um, yeah, th- this is much more along the lines of a traditional notebook, right? It's a it's a 15 inch platform, 15.6 inch screen. Uh, it is very thin. Um, let's see, 0.75 inches thick, and only 3.75 pounds, so it is under four pounds. Uh, and they're calling it a gaming laptop. And, and even further, they're calling it a 3K gaming laptop. So we're going to toss some caveats right in there right away. Uh, gaming at 3K on anything but maybe, you know, three years ago titles from, you know, days gone by is going to be a slideshow. Um, or I shouldn't say a slideshow. You're going to have to turn the, the um, features way back and the image quality way back to game at full 3K resolution. Um, the panel is capable of 3K, certainly in desktop and, you know, for, for rendering, you know, video and other things, uh, you know, on, on the desktop, certainly, uh, the panel is, uh, 2880 by 1620 IPS is beautiful, glossy display. Um, no question about it. So really nice high res display. However, the GPU and CPU combination on board, again, this is a thin device, less than four pounds. Really, if you're talking about gaming at 1080p, full HD res, um, with all the the bells and whistles dialed up, that's what this machine's capable of. At 3K, as you'll see in our benchmarks, um, you have to dial things back to at least medium quality. uh, And in some real GPU crushing titles, you have to turn it back even further than that. And so, you know, for, for example, I think we've got, let's see, yeah, we've got some Far Cry numbers at 1080p, and yeah, it's 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 pushing 124 frames a second for a, a title like Far Cry, which is years old, Far Cry 2 to be exact. But when you get to like Bioshock Infinite, um, for example, here at 3K resolution, yeah, you're talking frame rates of 21 frames a second, not quite playable. Drop down to, you know, 1080p, and now you're talking Bioshock Infinite, you know, nice DX11 title uh, with depth of field, ultra quality turned on. And now you're getting 53 frames a second at 1080p. So you're playing 1080p, all the dials turned up on a notebook at 53 frames a second. And that notebook is less than four pounds. So it's pretty, pretty darn impressive to get that into a thin machine like that. That's actually very impressive. Uh, I'm looking at the specs right now. Uh, decent video card on this thing. Uh, yep. b- beautiful display. The price is around twenty one hundred dollars. So it's not in a it's not a cheap laptop. But if you compare it to the performance that you're getting, it's actually a good deal. Yeah, it's it's a pretty good deal for sure. You you have to be you know the, the type of user that's gonna that's gonna want this machine. Number one is going to be either a gamer and or um, perhaps a workstation professional that needs. Some serious rendering horsepower on board. Integrated graphics and even, you know, low-end or mid-range discrete graphics are not going to cut it for you. You want horsepower. And so that's what this machine brings. It brings NVIDIA's uh, GeForce GTX 870M, uh, their latest mobile chip, 3 gigabytes GDR, GDDR5 on board. So 3 gig of graphics memory uh, on the graphics engine, you know, in and of itself. In addition to six, 16 gigs as tested for us, in system memory and system RAM, 1600 megahertz uh, DDR3 RAM, um, you know, Windows 8.1, 64-bit, a Core i7, um, quad-core 4710HQ, so 6 meg, 2.5 gig to 3.5 gig turbo boost capable on this. Um, so it's decked out 
and um, it is absolutely, you know, configured for performance in mind. 256 gig SSD. Uh, we actually had two by 128 gig in RAID zero. <laughs> um, you know, so so this thing, and and also a one terabyte hard drive on board, standard hard drive for your bulk storage. So you've got that fast RAID zero array. Uh, M SATA RAID zero is how it was set up for us, or M M two M dot two, excuse me, SATA Express set up in RAID, and and a one terabyte hard drive on board for bulk storage for for all of your files, and the OS goes on the SSD array, and um, yeah, I mean just loaded for bear. So you get what you pay for, no question about it, um, but you you you're gonna want to you know, pay to play. You got to, you got to be in that market. <laughs> so I'm actually looking for, um, a laptop to do video production on, on the go. And at 21 to $2,400, it's far more affordable than actually spending the money and getting a TriCaster, which is going to cost me about $10,000 to do. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only thing that is missing right now from this laptop is Thunderbolt. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're talking about um, USB three is you get three USB three ports. That's really about it. Um, I know video production guys. That's big. Um, you know, certainly uh, Thunderbolt technology for 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 what 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 sort of device are you going to plug in over that I/O? Uh, probably over to Thunderbolt. I'm going to split it into uh, three Blackmagic uh, Thunderbolt capture devices. Gotcha. And then just bring in the, each camera via you know the, each device. Interesting. I don't know how you could get there from here. Marco, you have any thoughts on that? I, I don't. He's... What kind of bandwidth, though, do those devices offer? Because I know USB 3.0 is not ideal, but it has the bandwidth for a full-speed hard drive. And are, are, they, are they rated SSDs in those boxes? So the issue with USB 3.0, there are, there are uh, converter boxes. So it's essentially just taking, it's converting HDMI to Thunderbolt. There are boxes. Blackmagic makes one. It's called the Shuttle. It's USB 3. But from my experience, these USB 3 boxes are not compatible with every USB 3 uh, chipset. Right. So it's only <clears throat> compatible with, I think it's the, the Renaissance chipset. And it's only certain Renaissance chipsets. So there, there is that problem with USB 3 and capture devices. I don't know if it's only Blackmagic. I don't know oh, okay. what gotcha, the problem gotcha, gotcha. is. So but... It's it's a little limiting, you know, what your options are, USB 3. It seems like Thunderbolt is the uh, way to go when it comes to video production. So, all right, that, I, that just clicked. I, I thought you were talking about external Thunderbolt storage for mm -hmm. larger files. So those, th those issues that you speak of, are they with Windows 8? Because with Windows 7, you didn't have native USB 3, and each USB 3 controller chip needed its own driver. With Windows 8 and 8.1, USB 3 is native. So I'm sure the, the chipsets do behave differently, but it's now native to the OS, so you're not loading an individual driver for each chipset. Some of those problems might be gone with the latest stuff. I, I can't say for sure because I haven't looked into it. Yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't in a while either. No, I, it's, been, it's been about six or seven months since I started playing around with this thing, and I kind of gave up because you had to flash the firmware with a different firmware from a different chipset to get it to work on... <laughs> on the Asus board, and and you know when I when I saw flashing firmware, and you had to kind of change the code in the existing one in order for it to work, I just I said you know this is too much work. I'm not even gotcha. going to bother. Uh, yeah. I did actually end up uh, Suncast, which produces this show every now and then. He ended up modifying it and getting it to work, but I would blue screen constantly, and that seems All to right. be the problem with USB three capture devices that it causes a blue screen. So, in my experience, I wasn't great. That's why I was thinking about Thunderbolt for something. You know, on the go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and there's no, there's no adding Thunderbolt. So yeah, yeah unfortunately, you can't. <laughs> no. Uh, no. But I guess you know, it, it's still a great, uh, great little box, a great little laptop. Um, I'm actually very impressed by the the form factor of it. Now, yeah. I, I, I the said guy, the guys at Main Gear are awesome too. Yeah. The guys there are just stand up guys. Plus, the one thing we didn't mention is nice automotive grade matte paint jobs on these machines, which is really yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah, this thing is stunning. Yeah, that's what they're known for. Uh, they actually probably, I, I believe, borrowed this platform from MSI, and then they're they're a systems integrator slash uh, custom builder. So they um, they basically configure it with the components inside, and you know, deck it all out and 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 qualify the build with respect to the components. But then they also had these really nice high end. 
paint jobs as well. And so, yeah, uh, you'd get a looker to go with it as well as uh, some horsepower, too. It's and, nice. and like you said, it's not a boat anchor yeah. <laughs> like, like some of the other gaming uh, laptops on the market. Yeah, you could totally carry this on the go to, you know, wherever. Yeah. You know? Now, uh, Marco, last time we spoke, you were building the summer gaming system. Yeah. And a little birdie <laughs> told me it is complete. It, it, it's almost complete. I just cleaned <laughs> off this whole area of my desk where I was shooting video of the build so that I can do the podcast. First, I need to apologize for, to the winner because he's been supremely patient. Um, ben, ben Shep, that won the system, has been waiting for it. And I, just between travel and a glut of huge launch pieces, I couldn't get the build video done in time. So I'm just about done. I'm hoping to have it done today so that I can have that video out for everybody to see and to get the system shipped to the winner because, you know, if I was him, I'd be waiting for it eagerly. So that's just about done. That killer 4960X base system that we gave away for the, uh, for the summer giveaway is going to be out the door soon. But and we didn't have time to send this in the rundown. Um, we actually can announce a new giveaway right now. It's not a full system, but our friends at AMD are going to give us two of their top of the line, very best uh, FX processors, complete with water cooling kits, um, five gigahertz, eight core chips. We are going to give two of them away to some lucky readers. And uh, yeah, we'll get that contest post put up very quickly. And for the uh, next few weeks, all you got to do is comment on the site, come participate in our awesome community, and you have a chance to win one of AMD's best processors. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and you know what it is uh, with the giveaways you guys do? It's not – I feel like the people that win are actually engaging in your community. And a lot of these people, they're, they're talking to each other. They're, they're, they're helping each other. And I think that, along with the giveaway, goes a long way uh, for me. When I'm, when I'm watching this, obviously I can't enter. Uh, it's a little bit of a conflict of interest if all of a sudden I have, you know, an AMD chip behind me and I'm saying, well, I won the contest, you know. So it's actually yeah. awesome to see how they engage and how supportive they are of these giveaways and, and of the winners. I was just going down uh, the comment thread of the posting made and it's like, congratulations, Ben. You know, people are excited. Yeah, yeah. you know, that's sort of the whole point of why we do these contests. We we're trying to foster a bigger community of guys. And I'm not going to give away the exact secret sauce on how winners are chosen, but you get some guys that when we do these contests and we're asking for engagement, they come and they, they comment a lot, but the comments are like, yay, that's great, or awesome, there's no real contribution. Yeah. So it's, the, it's the, the contributors that are actually contributing quality that have the best chance to win. So, yeah, we're, I like to think that we've, we've done a pretty good job with that and, and rewarding the, the true winners who have really embraced the community and, and tried to contribute and help out. I think it's awesome. Thanks. I think it's, it's really <laughs> awesome. I wish I could enter. Sadly, I can't. So well, I just be Dave, nice to maybe. us, man. Dave That's and I it. got tons of stuff laying That's around. That's it. You know what? Maybe I should make a little list for you guys. I need a video card. I need, you know. <laughs> I, do, it, the job does come with a few perks like that. That's we actually really cool. The toys. Yeah, now I gotta I gotta wine and dine you guys the next time you're in New York. <laughs> Listen, we like to wine and dine a lot here at GFQ. That's that's not a problem. More whining than dining, actually. <laughs> uh, guys, that's it's the end of the show. Uh, what where can people find you guys? I know you're on Facebook. It's Facebook.com/slash Hot Hardware. Also, of course, HotHardware.com and Twitter.com/slash Hot Hardware. And you guys are on Google Plus, right? It's a little weird. It's plus.google.com slash plus hot hardware. There you go. Yeah, no, yep. it's that. And then, and then, of course, if you're watching this video, you may very well be watching it on YouTube where we're found at uh, hot hardware vids. So youtube.com slash hot hardware vids. And, of course, if you miss any portion of the show, you go to hothardware.com. It'll be posted there. We'll also have it on GFQ. Uh, this, I had a lot of fun today, guys. I had a lot of fun. Laugh. I did. And, so did I. and for people watching this, uh, if you're not watching it live, also we record live every Wednesday uh, at 2 p.m. East, generally, most of the time. I think that'll be a good time, but we're, we're trying to keep to a consistent schedule with it. Uh, I got the opener in one take. So yeah. I want to give myself a pat yeah. on the back for that. <laughs> I didn't screw it up. Good uh, job, man. Yeah. Uh, that's it, guys. We will all see you next time on Two and a Half Geeks. Take care.